As in the pre-flood world, this expansion of population was apparently accompanied by concomitant advances in technology and civilization, CF. The urbanization of Genesis 10, 10 through 12, and by a concomitant decline in the general level of interest in and concern for God. Thus is it ever so. It was not long after this process had gathered momentum that Satan launched his next major counterattack, inspiring the premier political leader of that day, Nimrod, to fuse this growing population into a united, one-world society. Such a development, still somewhat inconceivable in today's multicultural world, would provide tremendous advantages for the devil's objective of turning mankind away from God. A highly cooperative, highly homogenized, highly centralized society need only be shifted in a godless direction once. For once the worship of the only true God is deemed antisocial and made illegal, it becomes an easy matter to discourage it entirely under such circumstances, especially in the absence of any alternative society on the face of the earth where religious dissidents who had chosen for God might find refuge. One cannot therefore imagine a more ideal scenario for the devil's squelching of faith than to bring about a single unified top-down state in charge of all human affairs on earth. For from this beginning it would be but a short step to eradicating all faith on earth by taking away the freedom of those who might choose to exercise such faith. That Nimrod was the human genius behind this satanic plan is evident from a comparison of Genesis 10, 8 through 12, with the account of the Tower of Babel at Genesis 11, 1 through 9. First, the tower is built in the very place of Nimrod's initial urban power base, the plain of Shinar, that is, Babylonia, Genesis 10, 10, Genesis 11, 1. Since this is the one place where all humanity is concentrated in the century following the flood, his supremacy in creating a political and urban structure for the rapidly expanding human race cannot be ignored. Secondly, Nimrod is the only major political figure distinguished in Scripture operating at the time of the division of the earth, Genesis 10, 8 through 12. He is the grandson of Ham through Cush, while Peleg, the great-grandson of Shem through Arphaxad and Eber saw the earth divided in his days. Assuming roughly equivalent generations, Nimrod would have been older than Peleg, and could thus have been in a position to foment the building of the tower by the time of Peleg's birth. And as the builder of the most important cities of his day, it seems impossible that any such worldwide cooperative activity, such as the construction of this infamous tower, would have been possible without his approval and support. Thirdly, Nimrod is singled out by the Bible for his active hostility toward God at this time. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. It was this Nimrod who became the first mighty one, that is, famous and prominent individual, on the earth after the flood. In particular, he was mighty at hunting men in opposition to the Lord. For this reason we have the proverb, to be like Nimrod mighty at hunting men in opposition to the Lord. Genesis 10, 8 and 9 Nimrod is the first to be called Gibber in Hebrew since the destruction of the Nephilim, Genesis 6, 4, a fact also emphasized in the genealogy of 1 Chronicles 1, 10. The word Gibber means mighty not only in terms of physical strength, but also in the sense of fame or prominence in other areas as well. The Nephilim, it will be recalled, were apparently gifted with any manner of human talents and abilities, and were possessed of almost overwhelming attractiveness. In a similar way, Nimrod was not a gibber chayil, that is, a mighty man of valor, talented as a warrior, the most common application of the word in the Hebrew Old Testament. Rather, Nimrod's prominence lay in the sphere of political persuasion, and that is why these verses carefully spell out the area of his mightiness, namely, hunting men against God. That the hunting here referred to does not pertain to the taking of animals for sport is plain to see. God's covenant with Noah after the flood authorized the use of animals for food, Genesis 9, 3, save only that the blood, a symbol of life in general and the work of Christ in particular, had to be drained off in a specific way. Genesis 9, 4. There is thus no reason that literal hunting should be in any way against God, 
the meaning of the preposition Lifni here. As indicated by his success in organizing the growing population of the earth into cities, initially Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, all on the plain of Shinar. Genesis 10. 10. Nimrod's amazing talent lay in his ability to persuade men to follow him, to hunt and capture their hearts, similar to the way in which Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel as a first step in fermenting rebellion against his father David. 2 Samuel 15. 6. Fishers of men is the righteous antithesis. Matthew 4. 19. This ensnaring of his fellow's will was clearly against God, as the sequel shows, and it is more often the case than not that, where political mass movements are concerned, their entire purpose and foundation are, when stripped of all facade, anti-God in the extreme. Fourthly, the very name Nimrod means, in Hebrew, let us revolt. We may surmise, therefore, that Nimrod was not this individual's original name, but that it was changed as so often was the case in Old Testament times, to reflect the crowning characteristic of his personality, as well as the most significant event of his career. The rallying cry that became the name by which history knows him, that is, Nimrod, is reminiscent of the similar call to arms that will be raised by the leaders of the final revolt against God, the Gog Magog Rebellion, Revelation 20, 7-9. Why are the nations forming into a mob and the peoples of the earth grumbling idly? The kings of the earth are assembling and its princes are gathering together against the Lord and his anointed one, saying, Let us pull off their chains and cast their cords from us. Psalm 2, 1 through 3. Finally, Nimrod's career is clearly split into two phases in Genesis 10, 10 through 12. The second phase, directed not at the plain of Shinar, where all of mankind was concentrated in the century after the flood, but to the more northerly climes of Assyria, must reflect God's frustration of Nimrod's original, more grandiose scheme. Following the defeat of his attempt to forge all humanity into one indivisible whole, Nimrod continued to put his special talents to work in the north. The ambitious agenda of creating a single worldwide state capable of retaining its hold upon the growing population of the earth required more than an individual of preeminent political abilities. It required a rallying point, a unifying symbol that would at once capture the imagination of the post-Diluvian world while at the same time providing sufficient motivation for collective action. In the selection of the famed Tower of Babel, Nimrod, unquestionably under the careful guidance of the devil, chose just such a symbol. This massive and impressive construction project could not help but be the universal subject of conversation in the unicultural, unilingual world of that time. Like the Ark, it was unique and, to this point, completely unprecedented. Unlike the Ark, however, which had, after all, been commissioned by God as a sign of impending judgment, as well as a vehicle of deliverance from that judgment, the Tower of Babel was not only not of God, but was instead decidedly anti-God. This is true for a number of reasons. First, the main objective sought by Nimrod and his diabolical master in the pursuit of this project was to parlay the universal cooperative effort of the Tower's construction into a future, enforced, unanimity of action on the part of all mankind. Once the precedent had been set, and sufficient time had passed in such a unified, all-out effort, the roots of a monolithic world-state would have been firmly set, compare the securing of the Roman Empire on account of the lengthy reign of Augustus. It would have been a short step for Nimrod and his cadre of sub-leaders from overseeing this lengthy, all-consuming construction project to assuming complete political control, 